Oh, the magpie brings us tidings of news both fair and foul. She's more cunning than the raven, more wise than any owl. Hello, lovelies. Uh, today we're taking a look at Sacrifice, an incense and iron RPG uh, designed for solo play or one-on-one -on -one play, uh, which seems to be part of this overall general trend that we are all experiencing. Um, so this is an OSR-style game, primarily for, as I say, a one-on-one -on -one or single-player play. And it's by Alex T, and I got it for free, <laughs> which rhymes, which is more pleasing than it should be. So keep that in mind as uh, as we go through the review. And uh, Alex wears his influences on his sleeve, and this is very much a berserk stand-in, with elements of Dark Souls and similar games and uh, a few other RPGs along with it. Yeah, he's upfront about it. He cites his sources uh, for, for his work. Berserk is mentioned. Uh, Warhammer Fantasy, Slimer, uh, Ruination, Pilgrimage. Um, books like Safe Hold, Two Fires video games such as Blasphemous and Dark Souls, films like Black Death, Solomon Kane, The Pit and the Pendulum, Medieval, uh, and a whole bunch of others. So what is Incense and Iron? It is human-oriented, low magic, dark, grimy sort of sorts of worlds with overbearing religions. Yeah, there's, a, there's an inquisition in the game. There are demons in the game, but mostly you're not going to be seeing people hurling around fireballs. Uh, it's mostly going to come down to the raw physical ability of fighters. So that's kind of the, the main thrust of the setting, I would say. It's set in the same uh, game world as Warlord Ascendant, the skirmish game I reviewed recently, and the two go together reasonably nicely. Um, mostly you are going to be playing as one of the branded, those who have been marked supernaturally for sacrifice to demons, but who have somehow, at least temporarily, escaped that fate. But as such, you are nudged towards the world of the dead and of magic more than most people. Uh, you are hunted by demons and you will encounter ghosts and weirdness and strangeness and undead and so on in a way that normal people don't in this game world. So it's it's quite sort of handy <laughs> as, a, as a plot hook. As one of the branded who has escaped and defied the, the powers of hell, um, you have certain powers beyond those of mortal men. Typically, you will start at level 3, uh, you will have a superhuman statistic, um, other advantages, and in a world of low magic, you know, these advantages that you have over other mere mortals mean a lot more because normal people are a lot less powerful. There's just a lot more of them. So you start with a superhuman statistic, strength, dex, whiz, or con, and you have access to a mastery die, which is a random amount of almost automatic damage that you can dole out each turn, and which is found in games uh, such as Scarlet Heroes, um, where you're playing something in that case more like a you know wuxia hero sort of sort of thing. And so all of this compensates for you being in the standard mode of play, you know, just one guy <laughs> against powerful monsters or many enemies. It doesn't really have a class system, but you can have different starting points and you can play basic bitch mortal characters at lower levels if you want, or if you wanted to play a branded and an entourage that they might have with them if you wanted to 
vacillate between single play and regular group play and um, solo play. So it has a skill framework instead, which which I much prefer in any game system. Really, I've never been a fan of classes and levels. Um, one aspect of the game that I do really like is that weapons that are used over and over again to kill truly monstrous and unnatural foes, they gradually develop a power of their own. They absorb fragments of the souls of those unnatural creatures that you destroy and so the weapon gradually becomes more and more magical as the weight of, it, of its deeds and so on pile up upon it. So the weapon levels up in much the same way that a character does. This is something that I've toyed with in my own games, particularly low magic settings. You know, how do games acquire power? How do you describe and define magical weapons, legendary weapons, uh, if it's not the, oh, let's just pop down the magic shop sort of way. So I've often thought about this and often discarded it as an idea because everything's just seemed too complicated and annoying. Um, so this game includes that which I love but it is extra bookkeeping which is something that I've always tried to avoid in my potential implementations of that system. So I, I don't think this is the solution but it is nice to see that great minds think alike. Um, the world itself gets a pretty basic overview it's a little bit scant, but for a game such as this, that might well be part of the appeal for you, as there's a great deal of space for you to move in and make it your own, uh, past the broad strokes that are applied here. But I know that some people are lore monkeys, and as such, they might find this game a bit lacking, uh, even when put together with Warlord Descendant. If you're au fait with the influencing source material, you should manage okay though. Compared with the slightly newer material that Alex has put out, uh, I did feel like the random tables and so on in this game were a little bit lacking, uh, as was the bestiary and the details on demons, etc. I much preferred his approach in Across a Thousand Dead Worlds, where you're able to quickly generate some somewhat unique enemies on, on the fly. And that's something I think Alex should do more of in his projects. Um, Style-wise, keeping in mind that I've begun collecting the Berserk volumes and have read up to number three, um, I, I think the book is good, but more space perhaps could have been given over to the art. Uh, once again, also, as with almost all solo RPG content that I've reviewed and read thus far, the endless tables have a somewhat soporific effect and a visual dullness to them and that tends to make these game books less presentable than they might otherwise be. I don't know what the solution is here either because tables have to be readable but there must be some way to do it with a bit more pizzazz. Um, if your game is going to be tables after tables after tables it feels to me like you should make the, the extra effort. I think it's fine when there's just a few tables, but when there's so many, it becomes visually monotonous. Uh, Dragon Warriors did this well in some places. Uh, there's a falling chart. Um, I prefer the older one from the old paperback, um, but I think they repeated it in the new edition, which was a good idea. Um, maybe that's something that can be aped or imitated or, or followed. Anyway, I give the game overall um, a low 4 for style, mostly by virtue of being consistent and evocative of the setting. Um, the book, the setting, they have a visual identity as a whole, which is a good thing and is often um, lacking from a lot of games. Uh, with a lot of games it's kind of like reading a comic book but every panel is by someone different with a different colour palette <laughs> but uh, everything here is fairly consistent uh, substance wise I mean everything is here that you need to play the game but not necessarily what you want to play the game 
Um, while it has a good contents page, it lacks an index. At 120-ish pages of A5, I can almost uh, forgive the lack of an index, but not quite. My, my rule of thumb is generally if you go over 100 pages, you should include a, a proper index. Um, and if, if something I've published comes in at under 100 pages, people bitch. But <laughs> but I, I yeah that's my that's my rule. Um, where you feel that there's not enough material more keenly is in the bestiary and the various random tables for solo play. In my not so humble opinion, um, it really hurts as a game for not having you know, additional content, additional options there. So substance then is a is a high two. But do consider that if you're not into games for super deep lore, then this isn't as much of a letdown and you may prefer the sense of freedom that it gives you. And, and certainly in this kind of one-on-one -on -one play and potential solo play, I think being too much lore heavy can be a detriment as well. I don't know where the sweet spot is, but this to me felt a little, a little too little. Um, as a whole then, that gives it a score of 6 out of 10, 3 out of 5, which is bang on average. As your tastes differ from mine, um, you can knock that up a half point if you prefer to forge your own path over a lore heavy book. And if you're a solo player who really loves Souls Likes or Berserk, you can probably bump that score, that score up another half point. I do like the rules shifts and changes, which meet my preferences a great deal, despite being still being compatible with the OSR. If I were writing a second edition, I would include a larger bestiary, some more depth in the random tables for NPCs, uh, a demon generator uh, with lots of options, maybe a little bit more lore on the countries and so on, but maintaining that broad strokes. And those changes to me would bump this up from uh, an average to an I shouldn't buy this, I don't need it, I have enough OSR books, but I'll buy it anyway. Zang. Howdy, I heard you like videos. If you're not already watching on YouTube, you should toddle on over to YouTube and you should subscribe to Postmortem Video, all one word, and you should click subscribe, and you should click the little bell, and you should select all when you click the little bell, and whatever other hoops that YouTube now has you jump through in order to actually be subscribed. Basically, subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs>